Finding your first job in dentisting is not easy. Hiring your first associate, also difficult. I have created Dentist Job Connect to solve this problem. My name is Paul, Dr. Nacho Goodman, founder of Dental Nachos, and connecting dentists for jobs is one of my favorite things to do. It embraces our amazing nacho spirit of collaboration, community, and helping each other. To learn more how we can help you, text JOB to 215-543-6454. You would like a free series of videos on how to buy a dental practice with success and not stress. Just text how to to 215-798-9897. You are watching Practice Ownership Success Strategies. I cannot wait to interview the awesome Dr. Josh Ferraro coming up soon. This video series includes interviews with accountants, attorneys, how to use a broker, and most of all, how not to cry too much during the process and be successful. So text how to to 215-798-9897. To be part of all of our updates for our practice ownership success strategies, just text OWN to 215-798-9897. Our episode with the awesome Dr. Josh Farrow will be starting momentarily. One of the best values that I can share with you as a practice owner, as a person, as a professional, is the Dental Success Network run by my amazing friend and Nacho sponsor, Dr. Mark Costas and Dr. Addison Colleen. What they have put together as a community for practice owners that provide you support so savings on supplies and access to Awesome C is truly one of the best values in dentistry. Right now, they have given us a free 45-day pass coupon to the Dental Success Network. I'm a member. Our previous guest, Dr. Christian Mullen, is a member. Text DSN to 215-798-9897 as an associate or practice owner to get the support you need to succeed with business leadership clinical dentistry, and most of all, feeling less alone in your practice ownership journey. Dentist Job Connect is proud to bring you opportunities to find a job or hire an associate. To do so, just text 200K to 215-798-9897 to see our highest paying jobs. We also have all of our jobs on the platform, dentistjobconnect.com. And if you're looking to hire an associate to help you increase success, and decrease stress, just text HIRE to 215-798-9897 or visit DennisJobConnect.com. I am so excited for my guest today, Dr. Josh Farrow. You can start your video when you are ready here. We were chatting a little bit behind the scenes. So just two dentisting humans hanging out here, different ages or stages talking about practice ownership. I was really inspired, Josh, when you reached out to me and you said, hey, I have a, a successful story to share. We're going to dig into so many things, but let's talk about the challenges of social media. Uh, do you find that many people pay more attention to negative stories, dramatic stories, frustrating Absolutely. stories than they do Absolutely. the positive ones? And Absolutely. as a Dental Nachos member and the founder, I sometimes say, Paul, I only see negative stuff. And I say, that is 100% your fault because you control your scroll. So if you stop on positive stories like this one and engage, you'll see more positive stories because I'm into sharing all of the stories, success and stress. And we're excited to share your story, Dr. Josh. So every video podcast in the history of video podcasts, regular podcasts must start off with this question, Josh. It is a rule. It is a law. Where did you go to dental school and when did you graduate? <laughs> I went to the Ohio State University, graduated in 2021. So a couple of years ago now. Nice. And uh, I want to congratulate you. So I've classified dentists like periodontal disease. So I don't know if you've seen this. I have baby age dentists, zero to two years after school. Um, two to five years is a tad, a toddler age dentist. 10 to 25 years, that's me, is a medium age dentist, what I call a MAD. So you are graduating from BAD to TAD level. These are said with total affection because, you know, in the circle of dentisting life, it's a journey. And we have my friend, Dr. Josh, Dr. Alan Stern, 41 years in practice ownership or as a dentist, that's a golden age dentist to GAD. So your classification is about to change because you're two years out and we're going to talk about this journey. So you graduated. What'd you do right after dental school? So right after dental school, I was using headhunters to find a job, right? I wasn't just looking on Indeed and whatnot. And I found an opportunity that was is about 30 minutes outside of Columbus. 
Um, the goal for me at that time was I wanted to have a mentor and I wanted to avoid being involved with a bunch of PPO plans. And I found that when I looked at jobs that were a little further away, that seemed like uh, a more realistic possibility. Geographically flexible, I call it. We run Dennis Job Connect and we just promoted a position in New York City that got so many applicants that we, the owner said, I can't take any more. And then we have that same job in the middle of Pennsylvania and it only gets a few applicants. So I'm not here to judge, just observe, but to echo, it sounds like what you're saying is your geographic flexibility led you to more opportunities. Exactly. And, and I still lived in Columbus, you know, I just had a little bit of a little bit of a drive to get out there. Um, but it, it worked out well, right? I ended up not being in network with any plans. I found a job that was in, in Thornville, Ohio, which is just east of Columbus. Um, and the way that worked was it was me and the owner. He had two offices, right? But we were going back and forth together between the two offices. He was training me for six months. And when he felt I was ready, he put me in that Thornville office by myself and he stayed at his original office, which was about 15, 20 minutes away. I think that is an awesome system. That owner really knows what he's doing. I think one of the things that practice owners do not totally realize when you hire a dentist is they may know how to prep a crown. They may know how to do clinical dentistry, but being able to operate inside of a private practice is a whole skill set that is impossible to learn until you're there. You can definitely take CE, you can definitely listen to podcasts, but until you are playing that game, I always have this ball here, Josh, you've seen it, to remind me of my failed dreams of playing professional basketball. And it is like a game. So I think kudos to your owner. What was the best part of him having your back? But then how did you know you were ready to kind of work without him? I mean, real, the best part was that you, you learn a lot of tips and tricks that dental school doesn't teach you. Um, and not all of that was clinical necessarily. A lot of it had to do with just patient management. You know, the things you're not really thinking about when you're in dental school, because you're so focused on trying to prep that crown, you're not really able to think about everything that's going on. Um, so he, he just taught me ways to be efficient, ways to keep the patient comfortable, and just how to how to make it a good experience for the patient the stuff that you're not really thinking about in school that the patients don't really expect either because you're a student. right because they're training they, dental they, school they, patients they that's one of the biggest problems and i have a lot of complaints about dental school but this is not one of them that is the the dental school patients are a certain type of patient where they are trained well and they know there's gonna be a 17 visit denture and one day you just take the bite room out of the box and you look at it and you put it back and then when you go from that to the real world, it is a it is a rude awakening to patient expectations. It actually shouldn't be. You want to know why, Josh? Because you've been a dental patient, and that's what you expect when you're in private practice. Right. You don't expect a filling to take three and a half hours. You don't expect someone to have to get up and get it checked. So you did. You took this training, and I asked this in the most curious way. What did he say when you said you're leaving? He must have been pretty upset. Well, so so what happened was, is we so like I said, we did six months where we were going back and forth together, right? It's kind of like a mini residency, you can almost call it. And then he's like, hey, we're going to we're going to split. So you're going to have your own team out here and you're going to have a full schedule out here. But, you know, you can call me anytime. Um, so anyways, I'm out there for two months. And then he um, said, hey, I want to sell you the office. He's like, I, I, it's just too much for me. Um, I want you to have it. You know, you know, the patients and I did not expect that at all. You know, I thought his plan was to just kind of have me as an associate out there. So what that sparked in me was, well, yeah, why don't I be in it? I'm already by myself at this office. And tell me, it's always about the right fit for you, Josh. I sell practices and I bought multiple practices and the purchase of a dental practice or starting a dental practice is the biggest decision of a dentist career. I could argue it's actually the biggest decision of your life, but let's just to South Korea. Why didn't you want to stay in that area and purchase that practice? So here's the thing. Originally, I, I did want to stay there. I was like, this makes sense. It's, it's a fee-for-service office. Um, but then when we started talking about pricing, we were in total opposite ends of the spectrum, which often happens. You know, yeah. you hear about that all the time. He, you know, the collection was around 800 and he wanted 900 and I was looking closer to 700 and we couldn't, we couldn't come to an agreement and the bank wasn't going to fund it. I, I do want to say, and I, this is maybe your, this owner is watching one day and I applaud their mentorship, but I ask with curiosity that it is, um, 
very unusual to expect more than 100% of collections for a practice. That's what the bank said. And they said, we're not, we're not going to be able to do that for you. And uh, I want to tell you, not many people like the dentist, Josh. Okay, I don't know if you've noticed, but people don't like us. No, but I don't. Banks love us. Banks love dentists. So if you are on a deal and the bank doesn't want to finance the full amount, it is a red flag. It doesn't mean don't buy the practice. It doesn't mean don't ask your parents for money. It doesn't mean don't do owner financing. Because if this is your, if your dream was to live in that area and that was the only way that you were going to do it, then maybe that extra hundred grand would have been worth it. But I would <laughs> caution anyone that if the bank will not finance the amount the seller wants, that you really need to ask more questions. And, and Paul, that's that's exactly the point. It's if it was my dream to be in that town, you find a way to make it happen. But it, it wasn't my dream, and I was like, this is if the bank's saying no. You know, something, something's not adding up here. Yeah. So, so if the bank's as nice as our moms to us. The bank's like us like our moms. So if the bank's like, here, here's 750 with working capital for you, give the seller 700 and keep 50. And they, when you say they want 900, I think it's just important that you did, you really did your due diligence well here. And I right. totally understand why that wasn't a fit. I want to catch everyone up listening. I'm talking with the awesome Dr. Josh Farrow on our practice ownership success strategies. One of our segments here with Dennis Job Connect, he's sharing his journey from dental school to practice ownership in just less than two years. So now you're leaving this opportunity and you're moving. Tell us about this catalyst for moving. Yeah. So, so what happened was, is he needed a decision and as to whether or not I was going to purchase. And I decided that I couldn't do it. So this was one year after school. This was like June, 2022. And I gave him a 90 day notice. And I started looking at offices in Florida. So after about a month of looking, I flew down and looked at three offices that were close to Tampa. Now, all of these offices were through Henry Schein, right? They have their website, every practice listed in Florida under their brokers. Um, and that, I would say that's the biggest one in that area. So I, I went down there, looked at all three, and I found one that was in Plant City, Florida, which is like 20 minutes, I guess, inland from, from Tampa. Um, and I decided to make an offer on that one. And um, during the closing process, it, it took a while. So I was down here subbing um, just at a, at a Heartland office just to make sure I was getting my hours down here because they're pretty strict about making sure you have. Yeah, dentistry is wild. Hours. All 50 states. It's like Hamilton days from the founding fathers. They can't oh, yeah, get along. It's, so, yeah. I'm in New Jersey, Josh, and I would lose my license for using an EFTA. But my good friend Todd Fleischman in Philadelphia can use EFTA. So the 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 nacho nuts uh themes of these states is tough i want to actually ask you uh because you you said you're working with a broker henry shine and you found this office and i help dennis with these decisions and i say the most important question to ask is why is the seller selling and listen to that reason so why was this seller selling well yeah that was that was the first question i asked and she because she was younger so I was a little confused. You know, she was 50, probably, you know, not not really at the end of her career, but she wanted to teach at the University of Florida and she had an offer that she said she couldn't refuse. So she I, I think she was just kind of tired of being an owner. It just wasn't what she enjoyed. So that's that's why she was selling. So to me, and I actually would share selling. that that is a that is a. Good, you know, if I classify reasons as a broker and as a doctor, not to just like not a good reason, okay reason, good reason, great reason. I actually think that falls in the good to great category because her motivation was not that the practice was about to go out of business. Her motivation was not that she didn't want to upgrade technology. It was exactly. that she had a life situation. And you were saying the practice was doing about $700,000 when she had it, correct? Correct. Yep. About seven, a little over 700. Yep. Before we get to your growth, tell everyone, because I think this would be really valuable. And I actually had shared this in the preview. But I put a whole video series together so people can text how to to 215 798 9897. And we will literally walk them through the process from LOI to asset purchase agreement to getting an attorney to getting an accountant. It's really a great video series. It's totally free to watch. Tell us a little bit about that practice purchase process. Was it freak? Did it freak you out? Who did you have on your team? Just give us a few minutes of that about that. Okay. Yeah, it it was it was stressful. Um, but what made it easier to deal with was having that team in place, right? So I had a, a CPA and 
he was probably the first person I involved, right? Because I get the pro forma or, you know, the cash flow analysis from Henry Schein. Um, and my CPA, he in Ohio, um, CPAs or really anybody can own a dental practice, right? So he had owned practices in the past. So I felt that, you know, he was very knowledgeable in the dental field specifically. So having a, um, a CPA that knows a lot about dentistry helps a ton. Yeah. Um, so he so he looked at everything for me, and that was kind of my first starting point. He's like, "Yep, this this seems like it could be a good opportunity." And that's what I love. You know, he, it's really good. I actually made a you know an Instagram thing, and you know, I said, "If you cannot afford to hire a team of advisors, you're not ready to buy a dental practice." And when I say if hire a team of advisors, it doesn't mean you have to hand over fifty thousand dollars tomorrow, but you have to have the awareness that I need to ask people who know what they're doing. Because the, what that CPA did for you, Josh, is he's like, yeah, this makes sense. And then that made you feel better because I bet you he sees offers where he goes, this does not make sense. This million dollar practice cash flowing a hundred grand being sold for $750,000 doesn't make sense. So I just like to highlight to the audience watching in and on demand and people can submit questions through the chat and Q&A that the role of your team is, is this normal or not normal? And it sounds like your CPA was on board with it being normal. Right. And, and, you know, doing this early on, you don't know what you don't know, you know? So yeah. Yeah. It, it, was it expensive advice? Maybe, but it, it paid itself off, you know, 20 times over. It, good, you know? good advice. It's I'm like an old grandfather saying this Morgan, uh, make sure you get some good screenshots of Josh. And I, but I'm kind of like an old grandfather saying this good advice is never expensive. Good advice is never expensive. And I'm talking about a nutritionist who tells you how to eat and you spend 500 hours, but you live longer. A, a uh, CPA that tells you about your accounting for dentistry. A, I know it's a dental success network is a, um, is a sponsor of our group, but joining that group and paying them to help you. So good advice is never expensive. And I'm really applaud you for knowing that because too many young dentists or new dentists try to skip steps with the team part. And then once you own the practice, you can't return it. Right. So like if you yeah. make a mistake, so the CPA was on board with the finances of practice, the seller is, got a good reason to sell uh she has an end time right she had this offer at the university exactly uh so then you when did you close on the practice so i closed in mid-october that that was uh, that was 2022 correct yeah oh gotcha so just less than a year but you closed when, which bank did you use i'm glad to give them a plug if I... well yeah so it, it was bank of america we, um is what I used for the first. Yeah, we they're not just sponsors of the group too. Did you look at more than one bank for context? I did, and it, it just seemed the most straightforward with Bank of America. I will say that the local banks, especially now that I'm looking at an expansion, which we can get into later, um, the local banks are more receptive to um, giving me that that second loan in a in a time frame that's less than a year. Yeah. Right. Whereas Bank of America has their protocols and they're not going to budge until the end of the year. They like their kind of straight down the middle type of stuff a lot of times. And that's why you learn a lot about banks. So that, that's it. So you, you take over October of 2022. How long did the seller stay on after you took over? Um, a couple of days. Just she had a couple of crowns okay. left. So yeah. tell us, I mean, I, you know, you're a relaxed guy. You got a nice beard, great haircut, all this stuff. But you that's got to be a little bit of a freak out factor. I mean, you just graduated dental school in 2021. Did work as an associate. I'm sure that experience was massively helpful. But now you're taking over a whole dental culture that you don't know, and she's out of there in a couple of days. Tell us about kind of that first month, first couple of months. Yeah, and you know, Paul, I was I was nervous at first, right? I'm thinking this is bad. She's leaving right away. The patients are going to freak out. But it honestly worked out to my benefit because I felt that they couldn't see me as the leader of the team until she was yeah, until she was point. gone. Which, which, you know, I mean, I'm sure other people could speak to that as well. Um, you know, she's always been there for advice if I need it, if something comes up, which now that we're kind of in a groove, it hasn't really happened as much now. But the first couple of months, I would say the biggest challenge was any sort of change that I that I wanted to make, that it would stress the team out. It wasn't that they were weren't open to it, but they've been comfortable for a long time. So adding in- I mean, I have a great business coach. I have a great business coach. We can role model this because you can use this with people. You know, if you cross your arms like this and she'd say, try to do it the other way, see how it feels. And everyone goes, that doesn't feel right. 
And she goes, that's how change feels to people. And it doesn't mean that they aren't on your side. And it doesn't mean that they think it's a bad idea. It's just that when you've been doing something for a long time in one way, you know, we, we changed from Salesforce to HubSpot with dental nachos. And it was quite the thing, right? Even though, so I think you're making a really good point that getting your team, the team on your side, it's more than just them thinking you're a nice person. It's more than them thinking you're a nice leader. It's, you know, and you, if you have empathy, I always say E squared equals MC. You can use this empathy plus enthusiasm equals maximum connectivity. And people forget about the empathy. So a new practice owner just be like, hey, we're getting digital x-rays. We're going digital with our charts, right? One of these things, they're, they're so enthusiastic, right? But they forget about the empathy where they go, hey, I know this is going to stink for you at the front desk to have to change over all these charts. I totally get it, right? What can I do to make it better? That type of stuff. Exactly. And I think what happens a lot of times is, you know, when you're right out of school, you're ambitious, you got your ideas and you come in there with with all this energy and your vision. But if you don't help them understand it and the why behind it, they're they're going to push back. You have to get them to understand yeah. the why. And when I could get them to kind of wrap their heads around that, it was more they were more accepting to it. Not that it wasn't stressful in the beginning, but it it made it a much smoother transition for the changes that we've made. I, I think Dennis taking over practice is a tale as old as time. So if I can go back to the future, to my practice transition with my dad, I did not like that the team were all these different scrubs. And my dad and his partner gave these really good scrub allowances. So they didn't have to pay for anything, but people were in Halloween scrubs in February. And I just didn't like the look. So I said to everyone, hey, here's what we're going to do. I want you to just all decide one color to wear on Mondays. You guys decide. And we're going to do it as a team. I had people crying. I had people yelling. And what I said to them was, hey, guys, I know this is a change. Here's what we're going to do. And you can use this, too. I want you to come back to me in 60 days. And if you don't like it after 60 days, we'll talk about changing it. But you have got to test it for 60 days. Good. And nobody said anything after 60 days. And what they actually said was, it's kind of nice. We don't have to think about what color to wear on Mondays, Paul. Exactly. And then yada, yada. We now all wear the same color scrubs all the time. 10 years later, but those changes when you take over, I would share with people that try to, if it's not illegal, immoral, unethical, or unsafe, you don't have to make major changes the first month you're there, right? So I tell people like they take over a practice, they don't like some decoration. I go, but the patient knows those de likes those decorations and the team likes those decorations. And if you just rip it off the wall, you will threaten the team. So that's kind of my balancing act there. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I told them because they were obviously stressed when they found out I was taking over. I, they're like, so what's going to happen? I said, the only thing that's going to be different when we start first day is that Dr. Borders is not going to be here and I'm going to be here. But other than that, we're just going to work. You know, I like that. That's awesome. You got to ease into it. You got to ease into it um, because you want them to stay, right? I had a very experienced team and the patients love them. You don't want them to leave. Right. Well, because they're the well patients, trained. the patients, sense change too. And even though they're glad that that doctor found a great doctor to take over, it's a process. So you took over a $700,000 practice where when I give frameworks, I kind of put that on the lower end of what someone should acquire in 2023. Yep. It's not a criticism. It's just that sometimes they say, I buy a $500,000 practice and I'm going to triple the production. And I go look for one that does like a million, like Christian Mullins practice did 1.1 million, but right. you've done this transformation now start to walk us through October through today, both with the procedures and the profit, because you've done something that's awesome. But I want to give you the chance to tell our viewers and listeners about it. Yeah, so so the practice was doing a little over 60000 in collections each month um, when I took over. Now, she didn't do extractions or root canals. Um, and really, she just did fillings and crowns, I guess, for the most part. So I saw an opportunity there, right? If, if that, that doubles, you know, the, the amount of procedures that you can do from right. that one without increasing your overhead that much. Um, so right away, you know, we have all these patients, you know, if they have a broken tooth and whatnot. It's like, oh, no, we can do the extraction. We can yeah. do the bone wrap for you here. Uh, I, Where don't did you, like, I have to give you a lot of one thing. I'm a big fan of GPRs and AGDs. You didn't do one. So I'm actually curious. Where did you learn extraction bone grafts? Because you're such a new dentist that this doesn't, I'm assuming dental school didn't teach it to you. 
Well, that, that's a great question. And no, I did not do a single bone graft in dental school. What I did was, uh, you know, remember COVID when nobody yeah, yeah. was uh, During my, my D4 year, I decided to take an eight month implant course in Chicago. Um, so once a month, we would go out there for four days. Oh, awesome. And uh, they teach you just from start to finish the process of extraction, bone graft, implant placement, restoration. So that gave me enough to feel confident with, you know, surgical extraction. So investing investing in yourself early, even though you were already investing in dental school, has paid off. It, in, yeah, in that sense, yeah, it's paid, it's paid off time and time again, um, because it gave me the opportunity to do more procedures as soon as I took And one them. of the things I want to share, I talk about three M's of associateships, which really the three M's of practicing. It's money, morale, and mentorship. And morale is the number one. If you make a lot of money and your morale stinks, it doesn't matter, right? Now, if you don't make six figures and you have a lot of debt and you can't, you have a great job with mentorship, that might not work out either. But what I want to share, share with our audience and ask you is, how does being able to do those extraction bone grafts help your morale? Forget about the production, whether it's confidence with patients, whether it's solving problems, whether it's your team being impressed that you don't have to send people out. How does that help your morale as a dentist? I think when, you know, you're talking to patients and, and an issue like that comes up, the ability to know that you have that skill set to help them out, right. um, it, it it feels good, right? Because, you know, yeah. the way they light up and they're like, wait, you can do that here? And it's right. like, yeah, like, no, I, I you learned how to do it. It's a very specific skill set that not a lot of people have. And it feels pretty cool that you can help these people out and do something that you know, previously they thought they had to go to a specialist. And something. that's why investing early, one of the, one of our sponsors, Ripe Global, Morgan can put that in the Facebook and the chat, but people can text Ripe, R-E-P-E to 215-798-9897. Dr. Lincoln Harris has created a training program from your operatory where they ship you models and you can learn composites, crowns, full mouth rehabs, implants, and there's a dental student taking it and there's a practice owner taking it. And yes, you may invest $25,000 over two years in your learning, and you will get such a great ROI, not only the ROI of production, but the relationships, opportunities, and impact you make when you can say, hey, we can handle that here, because there is no better feeling for that as a dentist when you can say to a patient, responsibly, you don't have to go out. If you, I'm assuming you don't take out every horizontally impacted wisdom tooth in the middle of your day, so you might say, hey, this is why you have to go out. So I really, so you, you not only could add other procedures. And then with this is not a criticism of the practice owner, but it sounded like she was not working at maximum efficiency with her schedule, you told me. It, yeah. And that honestly, that was kind of a selling point, right? You know, she's only doing basic bread and butter dentistry. And beyond that, I mean, she's given herself a lot of time for each procedure. So one thing that my CPA did tell me is like, when you go look at this office, look at the charts, look at the schedule, see how she schedules. Is there an opportunity there? Does every tooth already have a crown on it? Yeah. You know, things like things like that, that I, I really wasn't thinking about. So and that's another that value. See, you know what's crazy? Your CPA, a non-dentist, told you some clinical advice because exactly. he's seen a lot and he's seen not so great transitions and he's seen great transitions. And he's had a client come back and say, I'm not producing as much as I wanted to. And it's because they didn't do what he told them to do right there. Make sure not only can you replicate what the practice owner does, but can you add to it? Exactly. And that, yeah, that, that helps you avoid some big surprises. You know, when you take over, if anything, it, it's good surprises that you're, yeah. you know, you're production collections goes much higher than what it was previous. And now one of the points of this, I did this with Christian Josh, and this is what really bothers me. Dental school charges three, four, five hundred thousand dollars to get a degree. They tell you to wait to spend five, four years of your life. And then they don't talk about money at all. They don't, they just say, ah, go out and be nice to eat people, right? right. They tell you you'll learn that later. So yep. you have now doing what's a normal month of production for you guys, collection now. Uh, now, well, last month, we just had our, our best month was about 115. In collection. So let's just use this, that as an example, you've taken a practice doing 60 to 115 in less than nine months. You've talked about the additional procedures, you've talked about the efficiency and scheduling, this is tremendous credit to you. Have you had to work this, I'm actually serious, have you had to work more hours or hire more team members? So um, no, actually, no, we did not change the hours. So we're open seven to 230, Monday through Thursday. And then Friday is kind of like a by appointment thing. 
Awesome. Um, big cases and whatnot. Make sure, and Morgan, you tag Andrew Vallow. These two have to meet because he's in Tampa. So you have a great schedule. That's one thing. The team would not like it if you changed the schedule. That's a real. That's, I think that's probably what they were worried about the most. Yeah. And when I took over, I'm like, I thought for sure we'd extend it till five, but I'm too used to it now. And it's working, yeah. you know? So I always yeah, think we'll Dennis, stick with it. Dennis can't collude on like what we charge that's illegal, but I wish we could collude on hours. Like everybody just work like eight to three, right? Make sure the pace yeah. is coming. So you have this schedule. You have a great team. Uh, what has your CPA said? Your CPA must be impressed with this type of growth. What's some things he said? So he said that, the thing that he felt that I have done the best with, other than, you know, obviously production collections increasing, was taking the overhead from about 70% to 45%. That's, that's amazing. What, what was your key for that? Re really, it was using the staff or the team that we had and in increasing the collections and production with the same team, being more efficient about using the same team members. Because staffing is always the highest cost, right? Um, and I... I changed the bonus structure, not, not in a way to, to benefit myself, but in a way to motivate them. Um, the, the old system was $58,000. Anything over that, they got 20% of it, which I knew wasn't going to work when I took over. Yeah. I honored it for the rest of the year just because, you know, minimized change. But in January, I changed it to kind of like a scaled um, bonus system, if that makes sense. So, you know, 10%, if they hit a certain number, 15%. So this, hit. this is a win-win shared goals with you and the team. It makes them want to squeeze those patients in. It makes them help with treatment plan acceptance. I'm really impressed with this. Where did you learn all of the business stuff just two years out of school? Did was it podcast? Do you have a coach? Have you taken courses? Cause you know, a lot of business stuff for just someone who two and a half years ago was in clinic seeing patients. Well, it, yeah, so a lot of it was, I mean, you mentioned DSN, you know, Dr. Mark Costas, a lot of that was on his podcast. A um, couple, couple books that I read as well that were just dental specific about practice ownership. And, you know, you, you start, after you listen to a little bit of it, you start to realize uh, patterns. A lot of it is very similar. You know, what were just, some of those books that you had read? Um, dental Practice Heroes was a good one that I read. I, I cannot remember who wrote that book. Um, and I think Titans of Dentistry was another yeah, that, one. That, I read. that might have been Justin Short and some other guys I've seen that. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. And then a non-dental one was E-Myth, which I you know a lot of people. I love E-Myth. And you know what's interesting? I had an opportunity to e interview Dr. Gary DeWood, head of Spear. Uh, there's Coise. He goes, all of what we do points to the same truth. Panky, Spear, Coise. And with business, it's the same thing. All of these messages point to these same truths of being intentional, leadership, patient-centered care over profits, but caring about profits. I do want to remind people that they can join the DSN for 45 days for free through our sponsor link by texting DSN to 215-798-9897. What Christian said at his uh, interview, uh, Joss, was it, he joined before he actually bought a practice. And he said that was great because then he could observe these practice owners. So while it's awesome to join after you buy a practice, and I totally recommend you joining to feel um, like people are helping you. It also is great to join dental school associate. You know, what's interesting to me, Jess, is I, you found it valuable to take an eight month implant course while you were doing dental school. I get a lot of feedback, which I understand, but I try to push back on from young dentists. Oh, I'm already in a lot of debt. Why would I invest in more stuff? Tell your people, you're younger than me, why they should invest early in their career. It, it's hard to see it when you're not making any money, right? When you're just forking over, you know, it's student loans after student loan. But if, if you think about it, let's say that course was $10,000, right? And then I have five patients where I do extraction, bone graft, implant right. placement. You've more than, more than paid it off right there. And you have the skills forever. I taught implant dentistry for many years. And I would say, that, you know, I taught 50 of my first implant courses. And some of them were just like five grand. And I'd say, even if you do one case, you're going to pay off the course. What's, what's even more important? You're going to treatment plan better. You're going to feel more confident. And you're going to get these skills forever. So I think what's not your nut to me, I really bothers me about dental school is somehow we get people to say, okay, to $500,000. And then I'm like, do Write Global for $25,000. Do the DSN for $200 a month. Do Monday Morning Dentistry with Aaron Nicholas for five grand. And they go, I can't afford that. And I go, you are the same person that just took out 
$400,000. So I appreciate you sharing that with our audience. Be responsible. But if you wait too long, you miss out on the ROI. Of it. Exactly. There's a, yeah, there's a skill you want. I mean, it, it, it'll more than pay for itself within that first year. It, and, it, and I wish dental school talked more about that. I wish dental school just talked more about continual learning. Their job is tough, but I, even if they brought in, I was, I mean, dental school, I don't know why, they should just bring in Mark Costas to all the schools and say, here's what I do. But they're always afraid of dental students buying something. But you know, some people said this to me, Josh, they go, uh, you know, we don't know if we want you to come to the dental school because you might sell something to the students. I go, oh, I don't know if I'm like a, a really good business person, but it's kind of hard to sell people things that have no money. So they're really not <laughs> my core audience for staying in business. Dental students are like the person, people with perfect teeth in your practice who just get profies. Yes, it's great that they're there, but if people didn't have bigger problems, my practice would go out of business. So I wish dental schools just supported that mission more. And that's why I do, do these type of things with you. Yeah, I mean, they, they give you just enough to get by, I right. feel like. And then you kind of have, to, there's so much to figure out. The first six months was tough. It was very tough, you know, just getting in a groove, transitioning. COVID didn't help with that either. Yeah, you know? it was, no, and, and that's why the early stages of your career, the more people that come and inspire you and motivate you, and that's why we're doing this thing here. And, and I really appreciate reaching out to me. Why did you reach out to me? If a dental student was listening or a new dentist here on Zoom is listening or someone thinking about buying a practice, I mean, I give you the credit. I was taking my dog out. I see some message from you and I say, oh, this is awesome. And, and you reached out to me. Why did you want to tell this story? Um, there's really one reason. I, and I, I feel like when I was an associate, like I, I was learning a lot, right? But it, it was slow, right? I wasn't making very much. And not that it's all about money, but when you have a lot of debt, yeah. You feel like you have to hit a certain number to feel like you're going to be comfortable. So during that time, I kind of had some regret, like, did I make a mistake? I, there's no, I'm going to pay this debt off. You, you know, I didn't feel good about it. And when I found an opportunity to do something on my own, it completely changed how I felt about it. I mean, now I can't imagine, you know, not going to dental school and it's fun. Yeah. And, everything. So, and that's why these stories, all these stories matter because I just think that of all the careers out there, Josh, and I grew up with a dad as a dentist, I assisted him in high school. I would file charts in junior high. I was a resident coming to practice. You do not know what it feels like to be a dentist until you're a dentist. It's impossible to explain it to someone. The only thing I say is like being a parent. You just don't know what it's like. And people can tell you about it. So when the more context that people can get about this career the better it is for their success. Because I think there's a lot of frustrated, lonely, dis demoralized dentists out there because they don't know stories like yours. What would you, what would you say to them to do first? Let's say you got a, a new associate, just started, already doesn't like their job, thinking, I don't even know if this is for me. Give them some advice. I, I would say if, if you're right out of school, first job, um, you're not busy, you're unhappy. I would Focus, try not, during that first year, try not to worry at all about production or what or what your friends are doing, because you will have people right out of school that are doing a lot. They're really busy. You know, everyone has different trajectories. So I say that first year, just focus on trying to get better, learning as much as you can. And if you think you want to be an owner, which I think most people do, you know, I don't know why. I don't know why you wouldn't. It's OK if you don't, but yeah. go for it sooner than you think you can because I wasn't looking to be an owner that soon it's just kind of how the cards how the cards fell right so and now I'm like wow I'm so glad I did that you know I, you I love figure it. it out that's it it's you. awesome advice what is next for you not that there's something new has to be next but where do you see yourself going from here um and you you kind of alluded to it so as we wrap up I want to give you some you know chance to talk about your next because it sounds like you have some plans yeah. So yeah, Paul. So we have uh, the next couple of months. We are we're starting a remodel, or I guess a, a, an addition to our practice. So we have we're going to add four ops, two hygienists, and we're going to be looking for um, an associate to come. Wow! Out Imagine if you knew a company that could help you find an associate. I think you might be Job able to. <laughs> and and one of the things that I share with Dennis Job Connect is I really want people to find the right associate to that for them, both sides, to give you as many choices because. I mean, you 
the way we find jobs in dentistry is archaic, right? You try to find a headhunter. Some people try to go on bulletin boards. And I think that's another thing dental school could do a lot better. I mean, they are charging you hundreds of thousands of dollars. Could they put some career development help in there, right? And yeah. I think a lot of people feel, I mean, I'm literally talking to someone right now whose job fell through and she has an apartment lease and she's unemployed and that's pretty bad position to be in. And that happens more than people know. So you're going to expand, hire an associate. Um, how do you, are, are you, do you do any masterminds or coaching? Um, I will share if I can be a kindly annoying, uh, bearded, not quite as fit as you older mentor that this step, there's a lot of stress in this step, even though there's a lot of excitement that having, you know, how you had that dental CPA to rely on for your first practice. Yeah. I would encourage you to get someone that feels like this for this expansion. I mean, maybe you already have them, but do you have anyone like that on your side or you're looking to get anyone like that on your side? Not yet, but I'm I'm going to need someone because I, I, otherwise I'm kind of going it alone other than the advice that my CPA can give me, which is limited at this point, right? Because we're expanding. Well, the main thing I'll share with this, I mean, I encourage you to join the DSN and taste test that, but it's the team part of it. It's the building of more people. And that's good. That cuts across any profession and industry when you go from this team that you run and now you're expanding the people that's much harder than the procedures that's much harder than buying the right equipment it's expanding your culture so i would encourage you to look to check into some people who can help you with that because um it's very unpredictable people are unpredictable you hire no. an assistant for your new associate think she's going to be great or he's going to be great it doesn't work out well and now you're trying to do your work, your team saying, hey, Dr. Josh, this new person you hired is tough. So I think that would be my best encouragement for you is get some help with that. I agree 100%. Yep. Um, well, I hope to see you in Philadelphia sometime. As we wrap up, I don't want you to jump off. I'm going to say bye to the Facebook Live crew. Uh, how can people reach out to you to learn more about your story and also tell us what your practice website is? Okay. Yeah. So reach out to me. I mean, my email address, I don't know if it's in the, the PowerPoint or not, um, but it's it's Dr. Ferraro at ferrarodental.com. Awesome. We'll put your we'll put your website in, in there too. Um, Dental Nachos Facebook Live crew, really guac gratitude for you sharing, Josh. This is exactly why I do what I do. The power to put you in front of thousands of people so that you can share your awesomeness to inspire and motivate people. Hang around with me here, but thanks so much for sharing with us today. All right. Thanks, Paul.